Welcome everybody to the November 16th, 2022 Pasture Management Series. Uh, this month is a is a is an excellent topic. We seem like, hey, it's getting cold. You know, the, the pasture conversation, what we can do, some of those things is kind of getting colder, just like uh, like the weather. Uh, but this is over the next two or three months, four months. This is some of the most important time that will determine the success of our pastures for the following year. So um, hopefully we'll provide a few helpful tips that will get you through the winter and get you prepared for the uh, the warmer months with spring. So once again, we'll, count, we'll follow the same pattern. We're gonna look at what we're seeing out there currently today, what to be looking forward, not just over the next month or the next two or three months, and then handle any questions that you guys may have at the end. So what what are we seeing out there? Obviously, it's a uh, we've we've experienced uh, quite a dramatic shift over the last month. We saw some very very cold temperatures at the beginning of the month. Then we saw the dramatic swing to some extremely unseasonably warm temperatures in the 75s and even the 80s on a few of those days. And now we're back on the downward swing, and we're starting to see those. Very cool, cool days and cool, cool nights. Uh, I think we're even talking about um, right at 19, 20 degrees over the next three or four days, uh, maybe even farther than that. So we're, we're kind of getting back into what we would typically call the beginning of our winter, end of, end of the fall, but it's getting around more of the seasonal type, maybe a little bit cooler than normal. So. What are we seeing out there in our pastures? Most, if not all of our grasses are in the dormant phase. We talked about last month seeing a lot of the, the summer grasses enter their dormancy um, or the end of their life if they were an annual grass. But most of our cool season grasses are gonna be dramatically slowed at this point. <clears throat> Some will even start to um, have a little bit of growth, but for the most part, they probably dramatically slowed. And if not, we'll stop. Um, after this week's uh, cold burst. Uh, we are looking at right now, those beautiful buttercup weeds and other weeds that you're gonna see at the beginning of spring. Um, they have made their appearance for this year. They are just starting to come out of the ground. Some of them you'll have to work pretty hard in between some of the grass blades to be able to find them, uh, but they are there. So. Uh, They've, they've started their assault, and we'll, we'll look at some methods that we can look at controlling them over the next two or three months, uh, maybe before we get to spring. Uh, everybody uh, is feeding hay at this point, at least you should. There's a very, very few uh, opportunities that we've had to really stockpile fescue uh, or cool season grass like rye. We just didn't get the opportunity to plant much, uh, and there was not a lot to start with. But uh, we're mostly feeding hay. The good thing is we did get a little bit of regrowth, a kind of a regeneration of some of like our Bermuda grass, some of our warm season grasses, even our cool season grasses that were out there. Did get a little bit of a regrowth, a restart at the uh, over the last two or three weeks when it was at 75 degrees. Uh, but all of that is probably coming to a complete standstill and halt for both cool season and warm season. Uh, one of the questions that we can kind of discuss is at the end of our October meeting, we talked about there was a potentially an opportunity uh, during that time, during that, the last week of October, to go ahead and get some things in the ground. We saw that we had a, a pretty good warm up phase coming. And so the question is, is, you know, if you did get some of those things in the ground and you got a little bit of new seedling growth, are they going to survive the next uh, 10 days? where temperatures are starting out in the 1920s. Uh, chances are, if you've got uh, three in, three to four inches of growth on your grass, uh, this probably set its hardiness and it's probably gonna most likely uh, make it through. If you're in that one to two inches, it's kind of, it's kind of a roll of the dice. Uh, if it's been one to two inches and it's kind of, it's been up for three or four weeks and it's just not getting a lot of growth yet, you, there's a chance it's going to probably make it through. If it is a more recent growth that's just popped up over the last week, week and a half, it may be pretty susceptible to the, the dropping temperatures and may not make it through. But uh, that's just something we'll have to monitor and, and turn it over to Mother Nature and see where she takes us. 
But as we transition into what are we starting to look forward to over the next uh, two or three months, uh, this is one of, if not the most important phases for our pastures. What we do now will, will determine a lot for the coming year. And, and a lot of things, we always look for what can we do so we can get more? Um, what can we add? And a lot of it's about addition. What can, can we add more uh, nutrients? Can we add more grass? Can we add, add, add? And so this is the time to be thinking about what can we do to prevent losses? Um, because a lot of what winter is, is about mitigating our losses. So that will help determine what our pastures look like going into spring, summer, and fall again. So we're going to try to look at some different ways to mitigate some of those losses that might occur with, uh, with winter and try to look at uh, some opportunities that we can uh, get some values to a lot of our pastures. So we're going to look at uh, limiting pasture access. We're going to look at uh, opportunities for some weed control, some hay feeding methods, and then taking advantage of an opportunity to maybe fill in with, um, with clover, where we might have a few gaps in some of our grasses. So one of the first ones I want to talk about is limiting access to our pastures. Uh, a lot of in our mindsets, whether it's a horse or cows or, or, uh, or, or sheep or goats, we like the idea that they have access to our incomplete pastures and we can see them roaming all over the place. Um, but once again, what we want to remember is that horse is really, or that cow are gaining very little nutritional value out of those grasses. They're kind of going through the action of it, but they're not gaining any nutritional value. Um, just remember those grasses are going dormant. Um, definitely in the warm season and in the cool season, they maintain a green, but they are not really growing. They're just in a dormancy phase. So if you remember back in October, we, we showed a slide where the more leaf you took off, the shorter the roots. So the same thing happened. So those roots have kind of shrank a little bit. And so they're very tentative about their ability to hold in the ground. So any, any extra grazing further challenges those plants. So uh, right now we want to talk about where can we kind of limit our access to our pastures to some of our animals so that we reduce that opportunity to destroy what grasses we have. So uh, the first one's kind of a no-brainer, but uh, it limit access to highly erodible areas. If you've got a hillside, if you've got ponds or streams that you don't have to utilize, or you've got a, a transition areas between fields, uh, winter is typically a pretty, pretty wet period of time in Tennessee. Remember, those grasses have a very short root, so they're not able to really grab the, as near as much as the soil. So we have a lot of opportunities for erosion to occur. And so if any grass that we do lose can cause even further erosion in those areas. So we want to maintain that grass as much as we can in those highly erodible areas. Uh, we've talked about this time and time again, but the new seeding areas, uh, anywhere you did new seeding is extreme, extremely vulnerable to losing those seedlings. Those seedlings, what you see uh, above ground is about exactly what you have below ground, a very, very shallow, very uh, uh, minute root system. And so purely the, the, um, the process of just looking at them may actually cause them to hide and run away. So try to minimize any access. If you want any of them, minimize any access, whether it's the cows, sheep, goats, horses, uh, on those new, new seedlings will determine whether you have that grass for the next uh, spring or summer. Um, to me, porch views is one of the most important things. Uh, most of our farms are now uh, surrounding uh, by other houses and homes, uh, or it's just one of your favorite areas to go in the back and look out over your property and, and see your animals. Uh, but my guess is most of us, if we have a nice, big, beautiful porch that we like to look at, we don't want to see just a mud pit. Um, or a bunch of weeds. And so that's kind of what happens is if we don't limit access to some of those highly um, susceptible areas or, or areas that we, we really want them to stay in pristine shape, uh, those are gonna be more likely 
have a lot of damage done during the winter. So if you've got some of those areas that, that, that really mean value to you, whether they're a high quality pasture or they look right behind your house where you spend a lot of your time, you might want to limit access to those areas and reduce some of that, that access so that they are, there's not a lot of um, compaction and erosion going on. Uh, and one of the final things is just limit access to your total pasture. Once again, they're not really getting any nutritional value off of your pastures. They're, they're just kind of mimicking that phase of uh, what they would typically do throughout the day. Hay is going to be 99% of their um, nutritional value. So when they have complete access, they have complete access to be able to potentially cause damage on your complete farm. So um, look at, you know, once again, going back to rotational grazing, but limiting, limiting access to maybe the worst sections of your pasture. Uh, that way, the rest of it you can allow that are maybe a higher quality, whether it's um, a, a bottom or a top, limit access to those so that coming into spring and summer, you're going to have a really uh, good quality pasture and it's not been damaged at all during the winter. Um, Hay feeding. Hay feeding is another one of the big strategies that can determine uh, what our pastures look like as they come out of winter. Hay, hay feeding is, a, is just, it's just pretty hard on pastures. Um, some of it is we can't control it and we have to try to find ways that we could minimize it based on the opportunity that we have and others that we can control a little bit more maybe by strategizing um, things that we can use maybe on down the road. Um, round bales, round bales are just really hard, but uh, obviously they're a big component of our of our feeding system uh, for whether for cattle and horses and, and to a degree small ruminants. Something to look at is wherever you obviously feed round bales, you're going to have a lot of compaction, a lot of traffic. You're going to really tear up some of those areas. And what I frequently see is moving those round bale areas all across your your pasture. So by the time the the, uh, the winter's over, almost every aspect of your pasture has had has had round bales, and so you've now moved that compaction and erosion all around to multiple locations. Also, each one of those round bales contains lots of probably uh, weed seed. So now you've effectively spread a lot of that weed seed all around a lot of areas. So if you have the ability. Uh, maybe you have a, a, an area that can handle a little bit more uh, traffic, heavy traffic. Try to minimize some of those locations just so you're minimizing the spread of uh, that damage. If you're feeding square bales, if, let's say you're probably feeding uh, some small ruminants or horses, um, you know, try to spread that out a little bit. Typically, we, we throw that very near where we come out of the barn near where the water's at, where it's convenient closest to the house door. Uh, but maybe look at changing location based on weather. If, you, if you've got some uh, a lot drier weather, maybe feed them in an area that is uh, a little bit more desirable for where you're wanting them. But if you've got a lot of really wet weather and it's been wet and, and a lot of damage can potentially occur, maybe try to feed some of those square bales in an area away from where you typically would feed just to move that, uh, that damage, any of the damage that may be occurring by feeding those areas to a place that's out of sight, out of mind, or a lower quality part of the pasture. Um, but that may help you just reducing some of the wear and tear on some of those areas that, uh, that may be more valuable than others. Unrolling hay is, a, is something that's kind of caught on. Obviously, you have to have the equipment to be able to do that. Um, but unrolling hay does reduce the compaction because it spreads out the animals all over a, a wider part of the, of the farm and keeps them from uh, getting a lot of compaction and a lot of waste. So uh, one of the big issues with round bales is potentially a waste. The key with unrolling hay is that you have to have the animals be just a little bit hungry uh, to reduce that waste. If not, they, they'll eat something and turn it into a really nice bed. So the advantage is, is that you're spreading um, the animals out, reducing compaction, but you potentially can waste some more hay if you don't have animals that are very hungry that want to eat it right up pretty quick. Uh, it also helps keep calves out of those hay rings and where you get potential for uh, crushing calves 
during these really wet times where it's wet and cold and they're trying to hang around the mama and the hay ring. So uh, unrolling can, can play a good role, but it also can, um, can be a waste if you're not doing it at the right time and, and utilizing that. Uh, one of the, uh, the biggest um, attributes I think you can really gain, just like we talked about for winter, is having a heavy use lot. Uh, but not only having a heavy use lot for feeding hay, if you've got some of those, but let's say you've got a pasture, you can also build, build heavy use pads where you could feed round bales on these heavy use pads where you can continually put the round bale in the same spot um, all winter long, all year long, year after year. And this is really going to reduce the amount of um, damage that you're going to have on the rest of your pastures. Maybe you can put easy access where the tractor is not driving all over the pastures and, and getting potential damage there because you've got to feed whether it's uh, cold, wet, sunny, night, whatever time it is, uh, you've got to get, be able to get hay out there. So the heavy use, not only the areas around the barn where you're going to try to concentrate animals a little bit longer, um, but also having heavy use pad, uh, feed pads. The NRCS and the Soil Conservation Districts actually will, will um, in, in certain er times and areas, be able to help with uh, building a heavy use uh, feeding pad for hay. Um, and we can send out more information about that. But that's something that's worth looking into. And typically, they do a lifetime of, of one and sometimes two, depending on the size. But uh, it's something definitely worth utilizing and one of the best gains that you can have for your pasture. Uh, when you're looking at doing um, kind of finishing up the year or if you've got some dry periods, take the opportunity to remove a lot of that waste hay that's, that's fallen down. Um, wherever that starts to delay and decay and rot, we're not going to get any type of real growth. We'll get some weeds that grow in there, but you won't be able to throw seed in those areas in spring, uh, like an annual seed like rye, to get some growth out of those areas because it's got it's sitting in a decaying, rotting material, and so that seed will just go ahead and rot. So we want to make sure that after we're done feeding hay is to try to remove uh, a lot of that waste and then you know compost it or or haul it off, whatever that may be. Um, but don't don't leave that hay to sit out there if you if you possibly can. That's just going to give you uh, more access to your pasture. And then as you start to come through the winter, uh, it's nice to have a game plan for renovation. Obviously, a lot of these spots, even if we remove a lot of the waste, um, there's going to have been if we've been feeding round bales or square bales, concentrated areas. There's going to be a lot of uh, compaction, erosion, uh, a lot of the grass is going to be gone. So we want to have a plan for to being able to renovate these and utilize these because we hate to just sacrifice that big chunk of our pasture and not utilize it all throughout the rest of the year. So we'll talk about that as we go into the, the, the next year about having a game plan, but be prepared to, to, to do some renovations, whether it's through annuals, um, spring or summer annuals. So it's good to always be thinking ahead. So as we come into um, an opportunity, um, clovers are one of the most underutilized, probably, uh, tools that we have. Um, in, in, and they play an important aspect in, in a lot of ways. Um, sometimes they get a negative connotation, but uh, for the most part, they provide a, a lot of value to us, not only to the animal, but also to our soil and pasture environment. So picking the right variety is really important. And there's a lot of different varieties. A lot of times we'll see kind of a volunteer clover sitting out in our pastures. That's traditionally a, a, a white variety that you'll see. And so uh, some of the white, we have some intermediates and ladino or ladino um, clovers. They're a perennial clover for the most part. And these perennial clovers, uh, handle really well being grazed, which is why we typically see this type of clover in our pastures. Uh, it's one that can continue to be grazed. It can kind of be grazed pretty close to the ground and survive a lot of uh, hot weather, cold weather, it, it typically survives. It doesn't do a great job of reseeding itself. Um, so sometimes we have to help that every so often, uh, but it's a, it's a great uh, clover to be able to utilize in pasture situations. 
Uh, another one is red clovers. Red clovers are great in hay fields. Uh, they have a lot of nu nutrient value. They don't stand to be able to, to be grazed near as low and near as hard. So a lot of times if we put them in pasture situations, they can be grazed out over a period, period, uh, period of time, but they also can be considered a perennial. They do a pretty good job of trying to reseed themselves if they get the opportunity to get to that point. A lot of them will get overgrazed and uh, they, they lose that ability. Crimson clover is another one. It's, it's one that we see It's an annual clover. We see this a lot more in uh, situations where you're trying to get a good hay crop out of this. Uh, also, we'll see it when you're trying to do some cover crops. It's a very popular cover crop to, to terminate and then have that biomass go back into our pastures or on the field. So uh, two or three different varieties there when if you're looking at it. Uh, when we start, start talking about seeding, we start talking about a lot of times February is a good time to be to be thinking about um, doing some doing some seeding sometimes late January, but uh, typically the temperatures are still pretty cool, which is which is key because we don't want a lot of our other grasses or anything else to be starting to get active and growing during that time. We want everything to kind of be still dormant. Uh, preparation wise, there's a couple of different ways. Clover is actually pretty well, pretty easy seeded. Uh, some people will kind of very lightly scratch the surface. So it is a very, very small seed. And so you don't want to plant very deep. So very, I mean, you just barely scratch the surface, definitely not much more than a quarter inch deep, but preferably less than that. A lot of people will just throw it out on the field and kind of let animals kind of work it into the ground a little bit. Uh, it's one of them that we can truly actually seed that way. Um, or, or some will even throw it on top of a snow and as it melts, it starts to work its way into the ground a little bit. Fertilization, we do not want to do any type of fertilizing when we apply or when we start to plant our clovers, uh, especially if you've got an established set of grass and you're planting your clovers into the grass, what that will do is whenever the grass gets ready to go, it's going to fully utilize a lot of that uh, fertilizer and it's going to start to choke out those new seedlings, so uh, those new clover seedlings. So uh, we, we prefer not to do any type of fertilization when we're starting to plant these. Uh, rate wise, we're talking if you're going to just seed white, probably two pounds of, of white clover, maybe we can bump that up to three. Uh, a popular one, especially if you're in a hay or if you're wanting to get some pastures knowing you may lose some of your red, uh, is to do about two pounds of white clover with four pounds of red clover. Uh, provides a really high quality uh, return and adds a lot of value to your pastures. Uh, thing to remember is that our clovers are legumes or they're what we call broadleaf, um, especially if you've got clovers in your yard. Um, so when we start talking about broadleaf, it means that when we apply herbicides, they are typically broadleaf herbicides that are selective for broadleaf. So legumes would be very susceptible to that. One of the things that we talked about that there's some, uh, a lot of opportunity is to pick the right legume that fits with um, what we're trying to, to trying to do. So some of the white varieties will actually be able to survive uh, 2,4-D, which is kind of our most benign herbicide at the lowest rate. So that's why a lot of times we'll pick the white variety, the Ladino clover variety, and use a 2,4-D because at the lowest rate, most of your white clovers will survive. Uh, 2,4-D would kill all of your red and crimson clover. So that's important to remember when selecting this, which clover you're going to do. And if you're going to be doing any type of herbicide spraying is knowing what's going to kill what or what's going to the, the effect is going to be. Grazon and, and Grazon Next and Duracore are products that that we utilize a lot if we have really tough weed situations, and they are very, very hard on legumes. Typically, if you spray graze on or spray uh, or sp apply hay or manure from hay that from products that have been sprayed with that, you may not get, be able to plant clovers for at least a year to year and a half. They have that residual that prevents them from uh, growing. So that's something to consider as you start to think about which when picking a herbicide or thinking about planting clovers, 
what is your plan of action, especially if you have a bunch of weeds. Uh, the, the great thing about clovers is right now, um, the return is, is pretty, pretty greatly noticed because the cost of high cost of fertilizer. Uh, clovers can provide almost 30 pounds of nitrogen, which is a, which is a lot, uh, considering that may be all you need, especially in a pasture situation, all you need from, uh, for nitrogen purposes in the spring, if you can get a good stand of clover. And it fills in the gaps, you know, where, wherever you have gaps in your grass, a uh, weed is going to grow unless you plant something else. So this would be a good opportunity to fill it in with some clovers and get some return, uh, not only nutritionally, um, but also because that's going to raise your protein levels, um, but also that it's going to uh, provide a nitrogen source for your other grasses. So the final thing that we want to talk about as we finish up is some opportunities this winter is doing is doing a little weed control. Um, like we said, is those those winter we call them winter weeds, winter annuals, um, and our spring weeds are just starting to appear and they're out there. So uh, finding the right time to be able to treat them and spray them is is important. Typically, what we're looking at is finding about four 60 degree days in a row. Uh, over the last few years, that's come about right around Christmas time, and I try to send out a lot of information saying, hey, I see these days are coming, kind of be prepared. But if you can get out there at the beginning of that first day where you see it's going to be 60 degrees ambient temperature, daytime temperature, uh, we prefer it not be dropping down into the uh, 20s and 30s at night. We prefer it kind of stay in the upper 30s, uh, 40s, uh, but at ambient temperature of four 60 degree days. Uh, that's a perfect time for us to go out there and be able to treat some of those uh, weeds that we're seeing. Uh, the herbicide selection, really at this time, the only thing I'm going to recommend is 2,4-D, and there's two formulations. There's an ester and there's an amine. And we want to use the ester. It's a stronger combination. The 2,4-D ester will be our herbicide of choice. It is uh, active at the 60 degrees. Some of our others, Duracore, Grazon, and some of the other products may not have an active temperature that low as 60 degrees. They may be closer to 65 or even maybe a little bit above 65. So we don't want to pick one of those. Typically, they're not going to, they, they're not going to activate uh, at 60 degrees. So 2,4-D with ester is a, is a great product to be able to get most of the weeds like we see here, the buttercup. 2,4-D uh, is pretty hard on buttercup. The great thing about um, winter weed control is we're kind of working in conjunction with a few other things. So let's say that you uh, hopefully maybe got some planting done and, and you got some grass coming up. So you couldn't necessarily treat uh, some of those grasses because they were a little young at that time. This will give them some time to establish and we can go ahead and try to treat uh, some of our, our uh, pastures at that time. Uh, if you remember back, we talked about planting clovers and that a lot of them were susceptible to some of our herbicides. So in this situation, if you can get out there at Christmas time, be able to control those weeds at that time, then you can come back with your clover in February and then not have to worry about controlling near as many weeds in early spring after you've already established your clover. So we're kind of working in conjunction with each other and, and we're, we're being able to to check a few boxes uh, in one year where sometimes we might not be able to check as many boxes because if you go ahead and, and decide that you're gonna do some, you don't spray during the uh, this opportune time right around Christmas, if that's the time it, it comes, then you have to kind of pick and choose between spraying or seeding clovers. And so this, this opportunity gives us, maybe we can do uh, two birds with one stone. Uh, and the other thing is just environment. When we start talking about uh, spraying, uh, we also try to be conscious of what is our impact on not only just the pastures that we have, uh, but on other things in the environment. And one of the first things that we always think about uh, are bees. Bees are so important to uh, our whole life cycle uh, for our plants and, and our animals that uh, we want to make sure that we're conscious of our other uh, brethren uh, in nature. And the good thing about being able to do weed control when it's in the middle of winter, if the opportunity presents itself, 
is that we can control the, the weeds when the bees are not out foraging. You know, they're dormant, they're, they're in their, their hives. And so we can control a lot of the weeds without having impact on bees, which is a great opportunity. That's a great way to be able to, um, to utilize multiple things like weed control and, and not impacting bees. So that's a, it's a good opportunity for us to work in conjunction together with that. So that's another reason why I like to consider spraying that time if you're able to. Well, we said a whole lot in a very short period of time, uh, but I think if you're able to kind of grasp some of these different strategies and, and you know put a few in your holster and, and be able to use a few of these, or at least be conscious of them as we go throughout the next two or three months, uh, I think it's going to put your pastures in really great shape as we head into winter, uh, not or into uh, winter and then on into spring. And not only maybe can we keep our pastures at least a status quo, uh, maybe with a little bit of weed control and a little bit of um, implementation of some clovers, we can actually improve our pastures uh, during a time when we're not thinking about doing that too much. So um, as we roll into the, the new year in the 2023 in our next uh, February meeting, we're going to talk about just some steps to be thinking about recovering from winter. So it's great before we even get to winter to talk about recovering from winter. Um, some things that maybe we'll talk about spring planting when we typically don't talk about that too much. Uh, weed control, if, if uh, we weren't able to, to do that during February, and then when to begin to really start to think about grazing some of our pastures, because uh, sometimes we get a little eager, uh, which can set us back. So I uh, thank everybody. I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and we will see everybody in on February 22nd, 2023.